Thank you everyone who joined us. My name is Clayton Cheever. I'm the assistant director at the Thomas Crane Public Library in Quincy, Massachusetts. Thanks for joining us this evening. We have a great program ahead of us that we are co-sponsoring tonight with the Quincy Climate Action Network. Um, so if you are looking for what you can do to fight climate change, then you're in the right place. Uh, if you're looking for another program, well, then you should change the channel and look somewhere else. But don't change the channel. Stay here with us. It's going to be a great night. Thank the Con Thomas Green Library for partnering with QCAN on so many events after uh, over the last eight years. Um, this includes films and lectures uh, by experts from groups like the Sierra Club, Unit of Concerned Scientists, and from schools including Harvard and Boston University, Salem State University, and others. Um, um, that QCAN has uh, co-sponsored with uh, the library. Um, but QCAN is not just an educational group. Uh, we're making things happen uh, through our advocacy for a list of the changes we've helped bring uh, to Quincy. Please go to our website, www.quincycan.org. Um, and click on the tab that says about <coughs> QCAN. Um, the short version uh, is that we've made, uh, we've helped to make our city a lot more energy efficient and help bring in a lot of clean renewable energy, a process that's continuing as Quincy works to form a green electricity aggregation, which is a, an idea that uh, QCAN brought to the city. Uh, we're also pushing uh, the city government to start using electric fleet vehicles to make sure that the new building uh, construction in Quincy uh, adhere to the most rigorous efficiency standards. We're demanding that the MBTA replace the old style diesel buses that are currently befouling our city's air with zero emission electric buses. Um, and if you'd like to be part of this exciting movement, we welcome new members. Our meetings are open to everyone uh, since the pandemic began. We've been meeting on Zoom. In general, we meet at 7 p.m. on the second Wednesday of the month. To Zoom into a meeting, please email us at info at quincycan.org and we'll send you a link uh, that will allow you to attend the meeting. Um, that's info at quincycan.org. Okay, enough about uh, Quincy Climate Action Network. Let's talk about our lecturer. It's a great honor to introduce Ron Judkoff, who in addition to being a pioneer in efficient design, is a friend dating back to the late 1960s when I knew him as a guy who lived down the hall in my college dorm and played the guitar and sang folk songs in a gruff sort of baritone. Uh, after graduation in 1970 or 71, I saw Ron again when he was getting set to leave uh, for a Peace Corps assignment in West Africa. That's where we got involved in putting up buildings and first started to think about energy efficiency. By the time he returned, a time when few of us put energy efficiency high on our list of important issues, Ron had already caught the bug. He went to architecture school at Columbia University and soon after he finished with a master's degree in architecture, he started to work for the National Renewable Energy Lab out in Colorado. A couple of months ago, after 40 some years, he retired with the title of Chief Architectural Engineer. At the National Renewable Energy Lab, Ron made history, leading teams that helped builders rethink their craft with efficiency in mind. One of his more colorful accomplishments was to figure out ways to dramatically improve the efficiency of mobile homes. If you go on the web, you can find a photo of Ron taking measurements from his perch atop a double wide. Uh, the standards uh, uh, he developed uh, transformed the way mobile homes and other manufactured buildings are put together. Ron also led the team uh, uh, that uh, developed the first PC modeling system for building efficiency. Most impressive to me, his team developed the net zero energy building concept that will help lead us out of the fossil fuel age, an idea that QCAN has been urging on the city of Quincy for some years. In the interest of time, I'll skip Ron's list of awards and publications, but I assure you it's lengthy and impressive. Ron has lectured at the UN 
and at many professional conferences. And now we're lucky to be hosting him here at uh, QCAN and the Thomas Crane Public Library. Thanks, Dave. Um, there we go. I'm almost almost there. I've, yeah, I've got a little pointer there. Try not to annoy everybody with it. Well, welcome to my little fireside cyber chat here. Um, I don't know how many people are out there or whether I know some of you. There was a few people from, from Tufts University where David and I met that had exchanged some emails talking about attending, which really put the pressure on me. But um, <laughs> um, my the premise that I go into this talk with, um, a lot of people think of renewable energy as kind of being um, a side light in a sense that it's too expensive to really become, you know, like serious coal plants or gas plants and that kind of thing. And I, I don't think people realize how much technological advancement has been made and how much, uh, co uh, how cost effective renewable energy has become. So the, angle that I'm taking on this talk is to show you what's been accomplished, some of it at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory where I was privileged to work, and some of it from other researchers around the country, universities. Um, but in general, I wanna show you that regardless of what politicians do, uh, economics is extremely powerful. And um, when renewables, and they're beginning to be, are perceived as being the least expensive way to power our world, that is how we will power our world. It won't matter what the what the politicians do, unless they, you know, obviously for some reason, policy reason, put put obstacles in the way, or unbalance the level playing field. So, um, with that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what the National Renewable en Energy Laboratory does. NREL, I. Uh, refer to it fondly. Uh, this is a geothermal power plant. Here is a concentrating solar power electric generation plant that you can see. Uh, let's see, I have to see if I can partly move these little pictures over. There we go. And uh, this is actually a zero, 350,000 square feet foot zero energy office building. So that gives you the flavor. Here's a wind tower. Um, that gives you the flavor of what NREL does. And this gets a little more specific to give you an idea of what the place looks like. This is the main campus. It's about 300 acres. And up here is the wind campus, which is about another 300 acres. And you can see listed here, we have about 2,700 staff right now. Um, you can see, um, yeah, our mission is quite simply to develop green technologies, and then you can read the list of technologies we have down here. Now, my specialty is buildings, um, and so I'll talk a little bit about what we do, do in the buildings program at NREL and what I uh, did there. Um, Dave mentioned uh, improving mobile homes. Well, this little test facility here that I set up allowed us to uh, test mobile homes in an environmental chamber. And by doing that, we could develop a better set of ret retrofits for the low income weatherization program. And we actually made, by the time we got done, I did this project for about four years, working with wet, uh, weather, federal weatherization trainers from all over the country. And uh, what we do is we actually try different retrofits, test how they did, and it took one night to get the results. So the next morning I'd come in and tell the weatherization trainers what really worked and what they just thought would work, but didn't really work. And so we radically improved the weatherization of mobile homes and modular buildings. And then that affected the new HUD code so that that code was made in such a way that it, it brought, um, modular buildings up to the point where site built buildings were in terms of energy efficiency. Down here, you see a little picture of the uh, aerial view of the solar decathlon. That's something we started at uh, NREL. 
And uh, that gets students from all over the world actually working on zero energy buildings. And uh, for a long time, we used to display them on the Washington Mall. Now the show has gone on the road. And so it'll, it happens in different places. One, one, the last one happened in California. Um, this is one of the labs we use to uh, test uh, advanced HVAC equipment. Um, number of buildings uh, that I've worked on in our career, my career, and that kind of helped lead to the whole trend of zero and concept of zero energy buildings. So let's get into some numbers. Hope I don't, uh, you know, get too numbery for you, but um, people kind of know um, the problem of climate change. So the international, the IPCC has written wonderful reports on the problem of climate change, but they're really weakest when it comes to the solutions. So I'm gonna spend very little time on the problem, but here is the problem. And here's the piece that buildings play in the problem. We're about a third of the uh, primary energy use that's the stuff you dig out of the ground to like make a watt of electricity or, you know, um, get it out, uh, get natural gas out and then pipe it uh, to where you're gonna use it. And the world's buildings use about half of the world's electricity. So buildings are a big and important part of the issue. And if we translate that into uh, carbon equivalent or carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, the percentages are similar. Buildings are about 24% of the glo global um, greenhouse gas contributions. And you can think of a house as being about one and a half cars. You know, you don't typically see a house doesn't have a tailpipe, but think of a house as with a tailpipe and in a year putting out about one and a half times what a car does. So um, I'm sure we've all seen this picture, you know, the first Paris Accord. And of course the question is attentions or actions. And this image are the different pathways we can take. Uh, this disastrous pathway is business as usual. And that leaves us to really horrible uh, increases in temperature and um, I'm sure James Hansen, who was one of the climate science pioneers, um, got fired by the government because he was a little too outspoken. He, was, he would say it's gonna be closer to a meter of sea level rise by 2100 if we don't get off of this path and get onto, we're probably too late for this path. It'd be great if we could even get onto that path. Um, now we're not too late for the path if you take it out further in time, but you know that makes it pretty miserable for a number of generations of people. So let's talk about photovoltaics. Um, you're probably familiar with it. You know you've seen it on the roofs of houses, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about utility scale photovoltaics because that the economies of scale really help uh, the cost picture there. This is the uh, trend in pricing dating all the way back to 1977. And this only took us to 2013, but it's obvious that it dropped a lot. And this kind of zeroes in on uh, where we are uh, more currently. And, you know, the PV people always put things in um, cost per watt. And you always ask yourself, well, cost per watt, that's fine. Yeah, it's about a dollar a watt. That doesn't look bad. But what does that really mean in terms of what you would pay for energy? Well, with the calculator, a lot of assumptions, two slide rules and whatnot, um, I kind of calculated that for you. So where we are approximately now is about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And that's an approximate number because a lot of assumptions go into, you know, a dollar per watt, they can go to the manufacturer and find out all the things that go into it, find out what it costs, but it's a little bit harder. You've got to figure out how long is this stuff going to blast? What's the cost of energy, alternate cost of energy going to be? Um, and things like that. But anyway, to continue on, um, 
Size and economics matter. Uh, that's a little that's a little joke for my folks back at the French House at Tufts, if any of them are on, <laughs> any of them are on the line. But anyway, uh, you can see that along with the decline in cost, there's been uh, quite an increase, and we're up to about 33 gigawatts. That was as of about 2017. There's always a big lag in the data and all these kinds of analysis, the reports that come out. But um, that's a pretty good chunk of uh, PV coming into play. And uh, of course, the least expensive is the red line, uh, the utility. So cost does matter. Um, also, the technology has been improving, and this is where the work of people, you know, people at my lab and uh, other labs around the world have been tremendously successful at improving the durability, um, the efficiency, the energy density, and the cost, lowering the cost of these things. But it's interesting to keep in mind that that research is not stopping. Um, we may have topped out where we can go with uh, silicon-based um, uh, photovoltaics, but there's new research with new materials and perovskites, and that's a potential game changer. Uh, you could literally have perovskite spray paint, um, and uh, you could conceivably have uh, efficiencies in excess of 30%. So. Uh, that would be a tremendous game changer. And so the material scientists and the um, photovoltaic scientists have not stopped working at all. Well, wind, for where the sun don't shine, um, is another renewable that is, um, you know, has, sees a similar pattern and, and is a, also a great alternative to conventional fuels. Um, I just showed this picture because it's so am amazing. Uh, Spider-Man is on a rope over there um, and he's inspecting blades after a blade stress test at our test facility at NREL. Um, but you have to ask, are the blades more stressed or is he more stressed? <laughs> so you can see uh, not quite the same pattern in wind because wind started out a lot less expensive than PV. And so some of this variation that you see in wind had to do at first with whether there was any tax credits. A lot more plants got built, wind farms got built when there were tax credits and tax credits went away and less got built. Um, but right about now, the tax credits are gone. So what you're, what you're seeing for the cost, and I translated that to about 1.8 cents per kilowatt hour, um, you know, you know what it costs you in your electricity bill. If you're in New England, you're paying probably 20 to 26 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. So that's uh, that's what wind is right now. Uh, it's probably about 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh, I thought it was higher than that. Uh, um, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, Hawaii is more in the 20 and California is very high also. New England, for some reason, has gotten better. Um, so um, here's the increase in world wind power. Um, looking a little bit more at the US and a little bit more recently, we're up to about 107 gigawatts of wind. And that's almost all utility scale wind. There's very little distributed wind. Um, and you, utility scale wind is, you know, lots of lots of turbines in a field for a utility. Now to scale all this in your mind as to what portion of the total energy that we're using in the country or total electricity in this case, uh, this graph kind of gives you an idea. We're about here. And so you can see where just actually, we just recently surpassed coal. And so we're about equal with coal right now. So this, this, um, this, these, um, this chart was made by uh, Energy Information Administration and they're a group of very dour economists and they're very conservative, especially when it comes to renewables. But 
Um, I did see uh, that we recently surpassed coal with renewables. So you can see what portion of the total picture renewables is. And then if I go to the next chart, you can see that solar and wind, um, right now winds, wind is more than solar, but solar is catching up rapidly, photovoltaics catching up rapidly. And for some reason, the EIA thinks that uh, PV will surpass wind. And you know, I don't know what their what assumptions their economists put into their NEMS model. That's a NEMS. Na, yeah, I, I don't national energy model um, that they have at the Energy Information Administration. But this is your own your own government um, making these proje projections. I don't know whether that gives you comfort or the opposite, but anyway. <laughs> um, so here we go. Renewables generated more electricity than coal for the first time in US history. And that's where the competition is in terms of coal. Coal isn't truly the competition. It's politically, it's been made a big, you know, um, brouhaha, but coal really isn't the serious competition. And I'll, and I'll show you why. Um, coal's going to die on its own. Here's ultra supercritical coal, which is kind of the best coal technology around, except for this with carbon sequestration. And carbon sequestration is so expensive that they didn't even bother to put it on the chart. So here's the cost, cost of coal. The, the total, this is um, dollars per megawatt hour. Um, and that, that's what an ultra critical coal plant cost is. Here's onshore wind. Um, offshore wind is still listed as being pretty expensive. We're pretty new at it in the United States. We'll get better at it and it'll get less expensive. Um, photovoltaics, you can see the cost of photovoltaics. And then you can see combined cycle and combined cycle is um, usually gas where they've got a turbine powering, uh, they've got a turbine that's powered with gas and then they use the waste heat from the turbine to uh, create steam. So they get two stages and both contribute to turning the, uh, turning, uh, the generator. N uh, nuclear, which, you know, is carbon free, but it's got other problems and, um, it's up there in cost. So you can see how competitive um, the renewable technologies are. Of course, there's one hang up, they're non-dispatchable, meaning that they need storage, they're intermittent. They go when the wind blows or they're on when the sun shines. Whereas these are, uh, well, they're not completely dispatchable because it's actually a big deal to slow down um, a coal plant I mean, you can't just modulate down a coal plant. So they actually have to have peaker plants, which are made to modulate, and those are expensive as well. But here are some options for how storage can work. I don't know which one is gonna be the big winner or whether it's gonna be a mix, but this is a concentrated concentrating solar power plants. It used to be called solar thermal electric, which made more sense to me. But um, the reason it's concentrating solar is all of these mirrors, acres and acres and hundreds and hundreds of mirrors are all focused on this one point at the top of about a 300 foot tower. And the temperatures up there are incredibly high. It's a real materials challenge to, um, you know, it's only recently that we had the materials to be able to run this kind of plant without constantly having to uh, do maintenance on the receiver where all this energy goes. Now, um, a heat transfer fluid takes that, you know, very high temperature, um, get very high temperature fluid and it uh, creates steam. It goes to a steam plant and then it's pretty typical looking steam plant. But the interesting thing about this is because you have all this fluid associated with the plant, you, it's easy to create thermal storage in a plant like this. So you can store the energy, which makes the energy dispatchable. When you don't need it, you can spend time heating the storage. When you do need it, you can 
take heat from the storage and get the steam plant going to create electricity. But the cost is still a little bit high, not nearly as high as uh, we were looking at with uh, some of the coal alternatives like coal with carbon sequest sequestration. Um, it's in the range of around, right now, this is 2010, right now there's, there's a plant going at about 15 cents and it has 10 hours of storage. Um, the Department of Energy projects, and they, you know, it comes from their program, so they may be a little optimistic, but they're hoping by about 2030 that they'd have that down to five cents kilowatt hour. Is that gonna be a winner? I don't know, I can't answer that yet, but we also have other alternatives. So we have batteries. And uh, I think you can remember, it's not that long ago that Tesla was just making their big um, jump into the car market and claimed um, 10 billion in orders in the first 36 hours and all that kind of stuff. But um, what that means is a lot of car companies, um, some of the majors as well, are getting involved in electric vehicles. And I think I think their crystal ball tells them that the, the internal combustion engine is on the way out. It, um, there's just so much more convenient in electric, convenience in electric vehicles. The maintenance is so much less. There's so many fewer moving parts. The manufacturer is so much easier. There's a lot of reasons besides being green for electric vehicles to be the future. But what that means is that there's a need for a lot of batteries and a lot of research effort is going into bat batteries. So it has been the pathway to a um, radical reduction in the cost of batteries, especially lithium ion batteries. So we're down to about the 150s per kilowatt hour of storage in 2019. And you can see the pattern kind of going um, down there starting in 2010 to 2019. Um, now, it's interesting because car batteries need to be very energy dense from a volume point. You don't want the battery taking up the whole car. And it ha they have to be very energy dense from a weight standpoint. They, you don't want them weighing down the car. So, but when we talk about utility scale batteries, they don't need to have any of those. So um, I have hopes that exploration of new chemist chemistries, and that's, that's happening now. There are programs, there's the Advanced Battery Consortium um, that comes out of the Department of Energy and a number of other programs all around the world that are really looking seriously at how to make lots of storage uh, very inexpensive. And uh, lithium ion may not be the chemistry because it, it are, it, you know, it, it's these precious metals. They're hard to mine, hard to find. And uh, uh, that's what adds to the expense. So let's look at an example in Colorado of where some hard nosed guys that aren't, you know, they're not known for being uh, tree huggers, that's for sure the people that run XL Energy, one of the largest utilities in the country. And uh, in their electric resource plan, they put out for bid um, the purchase of energy for the next number of years that they, they always have to be ahead of the game. XL Energy, uh, here's the headline from the Denver Post, XL Energy receives shockingly low bids for Colorado electricity from renewable resources. So let's look into that a little bit more. Here are the bids. Um, I took, I hope I didn't make a, <laughs> make a mistake. I don't think I did with my little slide rule, but um, 430 bids came in, 362 bids were for renewables. Wind um, and storage, were less than existing coal costs in Colorado. So wind plus paying for storage, even where storage is now and its cost, were cheaper to build um, than continuing to operate the existing 
coal plants in Colorado. Those are coal plants that are already built. They don't even have to pay for them to be built. Just the cost of continuing to operate those plants. PV, photovoltaics plus storage, was better than 75% of the existing coal plants. You know, among the plants, there's the newer ones, which tend to be better and, and cost less to maintain, and the older ones. So the 75% of the older ones, uh, PV plus storage was cheaper, uh, was cheaper to build than to just continue running those. And there's about 25% of the coal plants that they'll keep running or that make economic sense to keep running. So um, this was a not that long ago newspaper article in the Denver Post. Xcel is gonna shoot for 100% carbon free electricity by 2050. That's just plain economics. And that's, you know, their, on their staff, they have their crystal ball guys that decide where they're gonna invest their money, and they're just making the decision on hard economics, not tree hugging, that this is the way to go. Now, is it gonna take till 2050? I hope not, and I don't think it will, because I think uh, the cost and the technologies are gonna change. The renewable technology costs are gonna come down and, and the efficiency is gonna get better uh, quicker than what anybody is anticipating. This is what the International Energy Agency projects for investments. So there are uh, investments in order to meet the, meet the two degree C target. That's, that's a target that the IPCC, let's see if I can say, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, the IPCC, which is a you know, world organization, which um, the United States is not exactly a part of right now, but um, hopefully that's temporary. Um, but they, they figured that this is the kind of investment that would have to be make, made worldwide to, to meet the two degree C target, which that train may have already left the station. I hope we can catch up with that two degree C target, but um, it's not for certain that we can. Um, and that's like about $1.6 trillion. Um, and that, you know, that's over a number of years, so it doesn't all get, I don't think, oh, average annual. No, I'm sorry, I took that back. It's the annual uh, investment for the world. Um, but meanwhile, um, you know, you kind of wonder where all that money is going to come from. Well, Europe, Europe's big oil companies, they have economists and crystal ball gazers as well. And they're beginning to see the handwriting on the wall that maybe investing a lot of money in uh, drilling and uh, that kind of thing maybe isn't the smartest thing they can do. So they're definitely starting to explore becoming energy providers rather than uh, drillers. And uh, so Royal Dutch Shell recently, um, you know, got contract or let contracts to build large wind farms off, nether off the coast of Netherlands. France's total is doing something. The U.S., Oil companies are kind of behind. Um, we could speculate on some of the reasons for that, but I won't. Um, but here's an even more interesting one. Golden, Goldman Sachs rules out finding, financing for Arctic drilling. Will other US banks follow? And if you look down here, you see Goldman Sachs and that's their portfolio, the size of their portfolio. Um, they've, promised 750 billion for sustainable investments over the next 10 years. Again, they're not doing that because they're trying to be green. They like the good publicity from doing that, but their crystal ball gazers are starting to look at um, um, fossil fuels as being a bad investment. So that's really where that's coming from. Um, and they will not invest in any coal mining or any coal plant plants that do not have carbon sequestration. Well, that says they won't invest in coal because there is no cost-effective carbon sequestration technology out there yet. Sequestration. Yeah. Um, and Lawrence Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, and I, I would love for somebody to double check this number because the number just blew me away, but it, it is the number that was written in the article 
said $7 trillion. They've, BlackRock is one of the largest portfolios in the world. $7 trillion will focus on sustainability investments. And believe me, BlackRock, they are not tree huggers. So that's based on hard-nosed analysis. All right. Well, I've taken about, I don't know, 40 minutes, 35 minutes of your time, and I've shown a lot of facts and figures. Um, and where we are is... I think I've tried to make the case as well as I could that regardless what the, of what the politicians do, economics and science are going to get us to a carbon-free energy system. And the question is, will it get us there fast enough to avoid being mid miserable for the next century or so? And, um, but nothing can stand in the way of those kinds of economics. And as soon as storage is in place, really inexpensive storage is in place, then it's game point, game, set, match. Um, it'll, it'll be renewables. So um, at this point, it's a good pause point to see if people have questions. Um, maybe, I don't know if everybody understands, and maybe it is common and I'm the one, when you mentioned that the comment before about sequestration and about coal plants who can't do adequate coal sequestration, um, what 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 is can you what does that actually mean? Because I think that might be helpful for folks. It who means need. that going up the stack, you've got to have some kind of um, mechanism or chemistry to capture the greenhouse gases going up the stack and then do something with them. Well, you can imagine that'd be a pretty expensive deal. Now, so it's the, basically a massive super filter. Critical, the super critical coal that I show, I showed, you know, a picture of a plant, super critical, a GE plant. And that one, that just tries to get high efficiency. So that what that does is it goes to very high pressures and temperatures to get efficiencies around uh, probably mid 50s to 60 percent, as opposed to mid 30, you know, low 30s to mid 30 percent on a typical coal plant. So, um, but the trade off on that, it, it costs more first cost and also the maintenance costs are more because you're subjecting materials to much higher temperatures and pressures and you're using fancier materials that you hope will withstand those for a long time. Did that answer the question, Clayton? Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank you. I assume most of the, the, the what you're talking about here are decisions that most of us aren't going to have many opportunities to really weigh in on. These are big corporations that are making economic decisions. Um, do you see a role for individuals to be influencing some of these decisions if it's really just driven by a bottom line? Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, and, and the reason is it all got started. I mean, the reason we're where we are is we had to get started somewhere. And to get started somewhere, we had to agree as a society to pay more, at least in a few instances, than we would otherwise have paid. And the only reason we got there is because people have been putting pressure and getting the message out. And, you know, the people in the big corporations, we just tend to think of them as automatrons or something. They're, they're not. They have kids. They think about the future. So there's, you know, some of them are nasty guys and you wouldn't want them as your friend. And some of them would seem pretty reasonable to you. But that, you know, the fact that that message has gotten out and, you know, they tend to be scientific analytical types. They, they understand the data. So I, I think that part is very important. And then I think the other part that's very important is we've got this lag time. You know, the, the real problem is how quickly we accelerate. I've kind of made the case that it's inevitable that we'll go to renewables just because the costs will come down. But we've got this lag before storage is inexpensive enough to really be the, you know, clearly the least cost scenario everywhere. So it's very important that in our own homes, I, I showed how big a portion buildings were, and actually this is getting, this is a segue into the next part of my talk. It's very important that in our, in our own homes, we try and be as energy efficient as possible. And also, you know, when we're on the school board and we're talking about a new school building, 
well, let's make it a zero energy building. Um, that'll do a number of things. It reduces the pressure to build new uh, fossil facilities before you know that whole storage thing gets taken on because that's going to be that's going to be what do you call that a standing asset. That's going to be a standing asset for a long time. Somebody builds a new coal peaker plant or a new uh, gas peaker plant or a new gas plant. I don't think anybody's going to build a new coal plant except in China, uh, but not in the United States. Um, you know, um, that commits us for a long time and we don't have the time. So it's important to keep the pressure on, on many fronts. And one of them is the buildings that we're involved in as citizens, whether it's our own homes or whether it's school buildings or whether it's a town talking about a new corporate center. Um, it's, um, and, and it has been at the local level that the most has been done. The national codes are not enforceable. Co uh, energy codes are only enforceable at the local level. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I, I'll go on to the buildings part of my talk and this will be a little bit less uh, number intensive and less charts and maybe some more pretty pictures, which are always nice. Um, anyway, this is a zero energy house that I lived in in 1973 in Burkina Faso <laughs> um, when I was in the Peace Corps. And one thing I noticed about this house is it wasn't real uncomfortable, even though I lived close to one of the hottest inhabited places on earth. So, um, it probably wasn't comfortable to our, the standards we're used to, but being a young person and adaptable, it was pretty comfortable. I'd go to a hotel in Dakar or something when I had to go to the main Peace Corps office for some reason. Um, and, uh, stay in that hotel and the electricity was constantly going down. It was very unstable. As soon as the electricity went off and the air conditioning went off, they, those buildings became uninhabitable. You had to get out. They, were, they, they could kill you. <laughs> and uh, so I became curious as to why that was. And another thing I noticed was like, you see these little clay water jugs here. Um, the water was always cool in those jugs. And admittedly, it was a hot, dry climate, so I understood um, evaporation a little bit. But not a lot of water was evaporating because I, you know, I, I mean, the water had to be carried in, so you kind of knew how fast you were, the water was evaporating away. And what it turned out to be, it's the, the clay material is kind of like this. Uh, well, it's kind of like Gore-Tex in a way. Uh, keeps the water in, but allows vapor to kind of slowly um, evaporate out. And it's just the right just the right speed to keep the water cool to, to the taste when you drink it. So there were a couple of, you know, I, I began to realize that physics was maybe pretty interesting, especially the physics related to buildings and building materials. So, um, you know, as I got deeper into this, I began to see the differences in indigenous architecture in different places. So in the, um, you know, in the desert, you would get these kind of, this is kind of a Moroccan, this is in Morocco, desert, you get these kind of structures very close together, very closed, not much window opening, and made out of very heavy, heavy materials. And there was a, there was a reason for that. And one of the reasons is, is that if you were uh, building for the ruler of your land, and you were, a, uh, you were an architect, <laughs> an architect or an engineer, if, if you didn't make the building uh, up to comfort standards, that person, you were in serious trouble. So, um, um, and some of the solutions were brilliant. So here's an example of uh, the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. And you can see uh, that's also a climate where evaporation works well. So um, they set the whole place up to be evaporatively cooled. They had hot court, cool court, which I can't go into all that, um, all that technology, but basically it's a court which is very well shaded. So that tends to be cooler and, and has lots of water and a court which tends to be very sunny. And that creates a pressure difference that creates breezes through the place, carrying the cool air through the place. They didn't have fans, you know, obviously back then. So, um, 
And um, even if you look at the surface, which you might think is just decorative of the massive materials, it's kind of almost a filigreed surface. Well, why did they do that? Well, there's something called the heat transfer coefficient between the surface of anything and the air. And you want to accelerate that as much as possible so you can get excess heat into this concrete thermal storage um, or uh, as quickly as you can and get it out uh, quick enough when you need it. So, um, you know, everything they did, you can see the deep walls for the mass and the shading. It was quite, um, quite brilliant. Now, another chart, um, there's something called the duck curve. So um, uh, you might have heard the term popping up recently, grid friendly. Well, I, you know, I'm as friendly to the grid as the next guy. I, th I think the grid is, you know, nice to have. But um, what does grid friendly really mean? Well, when we start to get a lot of renewables, and this is happening in some places like Hawaii and some places in California where they've really been pushing renewables, especially photovoltaics, um, well, the typical load pro profile starts to come down. More, more PV during the middle of the day, the PV is generating away like crazy. So, you know, the, the load for the base load part of the plant, whatever they, whatever they happen to have, a gas plant or whatever, goes down and down. And finally, it gets to a point where you've got to shed the load because you don't have enough load online and you can't turn you can't turn your base load plants off completely that's extremely expensive to do um, so what do you need you need some storage well with storage at that point where you would shed the load instead of shedding the load you start to charge a battery or heat water or heat a heat transfer fluid or a storage fluid and there you go you can begin to increase the load for the plant, but increase it on a gradual ramp, because if it's a steep ramp, the our typical utility system just can't handle that steep ramp. We don't have enough peaker plants and quick response plants to do that. So by having storage in the system, you avoid shedding load and you can put more, more renewables on the system and you also bring down the peak itself so you don't have to add more generating capacity to the system. So there's a lot of advantages to the whole storage thing. So for a building to be grid friendly, you don't want it just to be adding to this pattern. You want it to be offset from that, um, from that pattern. And so buildings themselves had a lot, have a lot of inherent storage. And so that is a way we can kind of bridge the gap till batteries are really uh, much, you know, very inexpensive. So this is where we are kind of showing the progression as we progress towards zero energy buildings. And these, these buildings that we're looking at around here um, are ones that we worked with the design teams that were willing to try to try and do you know, get towards zero energy. They may not have gotten completely there, but they were willing to try to get there and bring down what we call the energy use intensity, which is used, usually expressed in terms of thousands of BTU per square foot per year. And if that's not a term you're used to, I'll just say a BTU is about the amount of energy in a match. So you strike like a kitchen match, one of those wooden kitchen matches, you let it burn, burns out, that's one BTU. So now we're talking about, um, you know, thousands of BTU per square, for each square foot of the building for a year. So that gives you some notion of what that means. Um, anyway, this is the high end of the scale. And as we get down toward maybe 20, um, now we're getting down toward the low end of the scale. And in order to do zero energy buildings, we want to get the buildings themselves down to around that 20 until until we have the PV paint and the 50% efficient PV and all that, we need to control the load in the buildings in order to be able to make up the rest of the load with the photovoltaics. So um, houses are kind of easier to think about because we all you know, tend to live in them, residential buildings. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. 
and I'm kind of running out of time. So I may have to cut off a little bit in the middle, but that's okay. This is the fun part of the talk. <laughs> Not the real information, hard information part of the talk. So um, we worked with uh, Habitat for Humanity on this. Um, we, they were willing to build a zero energy Habitat for, for Humanity house. Um, we wanted to show that if you did, it could be done and, you know, as opposed to just our computer, computer models. And uh, so these are some of the characteristics it had for you, those who speak our values and stuff like that will mean something to you. But a lot of insulation in walls, about 11 inches. So they were double stud walls. Um, roof was R60, about 17 inches of insulation in the roof. Um, I think, you know, you have an idea of passive solar. The windows were set up so that it would help heat the building in the winter, but shade the building in the summer. And it had uh, thermal hot water. Um, so, you know, hot water panels. Um, and four kilowatts of photovoltaics. And over the course of two years that we monitored it, we actually monitored it longer than that, we came out about 27 inch, we produced about 2,700 kilowatt hours more than, and this is, you know, an inhabited house, a family, uh, Habitat for Humanity family, uh, about 2,700 kilowatt hours more over two years than, uh, than the house used. So um, now at the time we did that, that was not as cost effective as it is now, but I wanna show you um, before, I can probably I'll finish up with this last kind of somewhat hard to digest chart. Um, this shows a typical mortgage plus utility costs. So just think of, you know, think of, your monthly expenditures, you pay, if you have a mortgage, you pay so much for the mortgage and you pay so much for your utility bills. And so, and this is the percent of savings from the baseline, which was code at the time. So at first it's pretty easy to save energy. You know, you buy LED bulbs instead of something else. Um, and that, saves you energy and actually over the lifetime of the bulb costs you less than a, you know, incandescent bulb. As you get further and further out, you know, you get to the minimum here, which is um, the least cost. So from the owner's point of view, this is the most favorable point. It's kind of flat. So you kind of hope they'd go to there. And that's some combination of stuff that you did that cost more, but you put it into the mortgage and the uh, reduction in cost of the utility bill outweighed the extra cost in the mortgage. Now, if you get to the neutral cost point, you're breaking even as far as economics go. Your cash flow is exactly the same, but society has harvested a 58% reduction in energy and the cost that would go along with that uh, and the greenhouse gases that would go along with that energy. So this neutral cost point is a very interesting point because from the individual owner's point of view, it doesn't cost any extra um, or it doesn't, it doesn't impact their cash flow to any extra. They have a higher mortgage. Um, but, um, you know, society reaps this tremendous benefit and actually the owner reaps the benefit of being insulated from any price increases in fuel in the future. So, because they're, they're damped out, they're, they're not using very much of it. So if the price goes up, it doesn't hurt them as much. Now, to make up the rest of it, we've kind of exhausted the efficiency. And after that, you gotta make up the rest of it with PV. So depending on the amount of room you have on the roof, you could go further, you could get out to maybe 75%. You'd like to get to 100%, right? But maybe the PV isn't efficient enough, so there's not enough room on the roof to do that. So that's a technology gap. So that's where the researchers come into play with the perovskites and so forth to increase the, um, increase the efficiency and the, of the PV and reduce the cost. Now, the same kind of analysis, we can do the same kind of analysis for commercial buildings and we have, so we know, and, and what's happened in the time since I did that initial analysis is that PV has come down uh, architects and engineers and building codes have gotten more strict. So we are already getting toward that 
you know, 25, 30%. And the older houses, not yet, but for new houses, if they're following like Building America guidelines or the IECC current International Energy Conservation Code um, type of energy code, um, and this is where citizens can get in the act too, is to push for your locality to go for the, you know, most advanced energy codes. But the same, you can do the same kind of analysis on commercial buildings. And that was our stepping stone to zero energy buildings because it showed, it got that codes going advanced. We showed that it was economically favorable to push the codes to higher energy efficiency um, for buildings. And, and the code started to change because of that. Um, so I am about three minutes over what is supposed to be my allotted time. Um, as I told Clayton, I have an infinite amount of material, <laughs> um, but um, I could stop it there. I'll just maybe take two more minutes to talk about the 350,000 square foot zero energy building on our campus. Um, this is the building. There's another set of wings that are uh, further to, further out that way. And uh, it is truly a zero energy, uh, you know, 350,000 square foot office building. I work in that building or worked in that building. And I can tell you that it's more comfortable and, than an ordinary building. It, it's very quiet because it doesn't have any uh, fans pushing air around so you don't hear the you don't hear the fans so quiet we had to put white noise in <laughs> which is uh, lots of funny interesting stories that I could tell but maybe um, maybe another time where we focus more on the technology of buildings um, but uh, the one thing I'd say is it cannot power itself just based on its roof area so it's powering itself based on its roof area and based on the roof area of a parking garage, which also has photovoltaics on it. Um, so something to look forward to when we can get to the point where we can power buildings like this completely in their own footprint. And uh, that's why the research marches on. Well, I, I think I'll end things here, um, but I'll just kind of, <laughs> show you what you missed. <laughs> um, so to, you know, kind of come full circle, um, I start out, is it smoke? Is it mirrors? You know, is it for real? It's not smoke. It might involve some mirrors um, if we go to concentrating solar power for storage. Um, and we can do it if we have the collective will. Our will as citizens does count. I didn't want to give that impression by any means. But um, you know the, the economics are also very powerful. So um, take hope and take encouragement in the fact that um, hard-nosed economics are on our side. And in order to accelerate that as citizens, that's where we need to be active. I mean, building a, building a, uh, a gas pipeline now is insane. You know, making that kind of investment is insane. I mean, it's going to be there. It's going to be there and people are going to want it to pay itself off. And well, then you're stuck with the darn thing. Same with new power plants and things like that. So um, that's that's my story and I'll stick to it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ron. Um, David, I don't know if you had anything you'd like to add at this point. I know we have, a, we have one audience member, another QCAN member who has a question or two uh, for Ron. Um, and I'm happy to, to ask her to unmute her mic and, and ask that question, if, unless there's something you'd like to add, David. You're muted too, but you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm good. I had one little question about the uh, photovoltaics. Could you, uh, Ron, uh, speak a little bit about uh, what uh, NREL has done to increase, increase the efficiency of um, of uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, cells and uh, and uh, whether that added anything to the cost. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, finish your question, Dave, and then I'll respond. 
uh, I uh, asked uh, what, uh, what uh, NREL had done to uh, yeah, no, I got it. Okay, and, I, I, and, I, and and whether and whether that had uh, whether that increases the cost or whether uh, the the product itself uh, costs the same as as the less efficient. Uh, um, yeah, well, the, the the pattern has been that um, you know at first when you go to higher efficiency, it costs more. And it has all kinds of problems. You know, I mean, it's not as durable. Maybe it's more sensitive to uh, temperature, so it loses efficiency as the temperature rises in the material. All kind of, all kind of stuff. But then the research continues, and photovoltaics is the largest single program. Has been uh, historically and continues to be the largest single program at NREL. Um, and in fact, uh, when people think they've broken a record for photovoltaics, they send their cells to NREL to be tested according to a test procedure that NREL developed in the world, uh, the world adheres to. So we are one of the leading centers. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's some good ones in China that we may or may not know about and elsewhere. Um, but uh, we're one of the leading in photovoltaics. And the whole purpose has always been to increase the performance and lower the cost. So those go hand in hand. Now, there are a couple of cases, and I'm quite envious of the scientist who, who did this. Sarah Kurtz, Dr. Sarah Kurtz, um, developed a technology that was much more efficient and much more expensive, and they were never able to bring down the cost. So um, when you need to power a space module, uh, for extraterrestrial applications, that's where it gets <laughs> that's where it gets used because they don't care about the cost. They they definitely care about the weight, the volume, and getting the maximum energy out of this out of the cells. Those are called tandem cells, and uh, you know I, I can go as deep as you want on how all that works. But um, so there are cases, but that's not what the main the mainstream goal at NREL has been. The mainstream goal has been to reduce costs, and that's why there's so much excitement about perovskites because it's very cheap organic type material, but uh, because it's this organic type material, um, like organic LEDs used to have a durability problem. Well, that's the stage we're at right now with the perovskites where they have a durability problem and that's what they're working on. You know, small changes in the chemistry, which don't increase the cost, um, but increase the durability by a lot. Um, that's what we're hoping for. All right. Thank you, Ron. Um, so I know we're getting lots of great information. I want to encourage folks, if they'd like to raise a hand, if they'd like to send me something into the chat, they can do something. Uh, they can definitely use the chat here in Zoom or on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, and I'm going to ask somebody who has asked some questions in the chat and said that they were interested in asking and, and being unmuted. So I'm going to go ahead and ask them to unmute themselves, which I believe I've just done. And uh, please, you have the floor. Is it me? So, it is you. Oh, okay. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. Uh, we have a, a compressor station that's uh, just been built down the road that will be a stranded asset um, and uh, is, is going to be doing blowdowns this week. So, um, so those are the kind of things we're dealing with. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I was wondering what you think of Biden's uh, plan for, uh, you know, to deal with climate change. Uh, he's talked about $2 trillion and uh, uh, a, a whole program that he has. And the other question is about uh, geothermal, because there, are, there is a pilot um, in this area um, to use collective geothermal for heating and cooling. So uh, those are my questions. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I'm going to start with the geothermal, with the technical question first, the geothermal question. Um, so is it a geothermal electricity production plant or is it a geothermal heat uh, plant, you know, just using the heat to uh, heat and if you have the right kind of technology, cool uh, the built environment? I, th I think it's using water, um, and but it is for heating and cooling. It is for heating. Yeah, so it's not it, it's not producing electricity. Uh, as far as I know, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, those 
those work fine and they're good and they're great. Um, you know, plants like that tend to be great. You're uh, fairly densely populated because um, they require piping, you know, piping the, the heat transfer fluid to where it needs to go. Um, so Europe um, has a lot of district heat and some of it'll be, some of it's based on geothermal sources. Sometimes it'll be based on other uh, waste heat sources are a good source for that kind of thing as, as well. Um, so those, those are great. Those are good. And uh, the nice thing about those is they tend to be dispatchable. So they help stabilize the grid and so allow you to get more wind and intermittent sources on along with it. Um, now the other question, uh oh, I can't remember two things at a time. Um, just remind me what, oh, Biden, Biden, yes. Biden. Um, well, um, you know, I, I, I'll admit I haven't read the Biden plan in great detail just because, um, you know, there's a, there's a bigger, there's a bigger political question. I kind of know, <laughs> I kind of know I'm much more for what Biden, whatever Biden is proposing, <laughs> proposing I'm much more for. But um, I, I've seen a little bit about what that plan is. And uh, it actually, it actually fits into something had I had a little bit more time. Um, I would have gone into, but you're talking about the amount of money, three trillion. So, you know, we looked at what IEA had thought was going to be necessary for the world, and that was about 1.6 trillion per year. Um, and I had done some calculations uh, a while back. Let me see if I can just get to a key. Oh, what happened to it? Ah, here it is. So I had made a bunch of assumptions to try and figure out what it would cost. Um, you know, by putting PV on roofs and um, uh, retrofitting houses to be more efficient and making more efficient energy codes. And I had come up with the cost at about 113, uh, 113 plus 25.5 um, uh, billion per year. So about 138, about 140, um, 113 billion per year for the first 23 years and then 25.5 billion per year. Um, just, just to deal with the uh, buildings sector. Um, and, uh, you know, it, actually it's looking better. I did this analysis in about 2007 and the costs have come down for all this stuff but the return has gone up for all the stuff. So this line is the return line and there's a crossover point. I mean, nice thing about, nice thing about these kinds of technologies is you're not constantly paying for fuel. You pay for them once. Yeah, you might amortize that over time, but you pay for it and then you're not paying anything else for fuel. So once you hit the crossover point, it's all gravy. And the gravy was in, uh, you know, I had a, <laughs> that's an amazing coincidence. I had the crossover point at about 3 trillion, 3,000 billion, that's 3 trillion. And uh, then it was all gravy after that, as long as the stuff lasted and didn't need to be replaced. And PV is very durable now. Um, I mean, the guarantee, usually the warranties last for 30 years and they last longer than that. So, um, and insulation in walls and things of that nature last a lot longer than that. So um, it sounds like the cost numbers, you know, are kind of in the in the same ball ball ballpark, <laughs> and uh, that would bring us down in the building stock and the whole U.S. building stock to the same uh, carbon levels we had in 1980. Oh, okay. so, but that's a whole different. I I can't you know, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> um, and that that one's, I I posited as a modest proposal if I were king, <laughs> how, how I would do it. Um, but it sounds like it sounds like the Biden plan has like uh, has some of those um, aspects to it. Thank you. All right, thanks, Faye. We have uh, two uh, more people in line right now. The next person I want to recognize is Julie. Julie, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks. 
thanks for this wonderful presentation, which is quite encouraging. It really gives us reason to hope. Um, my question for you is, I'd love to hear you talk more about the visitor center at Zion National Park, which I visited a few years ago, and I was so taken with it. It's such a beautiful structure. Um, and we realized at the time that we were there that it was being, I guess, cooled because we were in there in summer um, with these great big towers. Can you talk a little bit more about that building? Also, my question would be is, uh, has the Parks Department enjoyed it? And if they ever have money again to build more structures, will they go with similar uh, technology, do you think? Well, um, the technology will have to be different depending on where the, you know, where the park is. If it's a park in Fairbanks, Alaska, that technology is not going to work, but other technologies can, can yield um, energy savings equally. So it's a, it's what we call bioclimatic architecture. It's architecture that uh, gives people comfort, but is well adapted to the climate that it's in. But since you mentioned Zion, one of my favorite projects in all the world, I'll just say a few words about it. So um, here we are, those are cooling towers and uh, they're downdraft cooling towers. They don't need any fans. Um, they have some little pumps. The water gets up to this height because it pulls off the river at a height that'll allow it to just get here by its own flow. And then, uh, but we do have a little pump. That's the only energy in the system, just a little pump to lift water from the reservoir that's at the bottom. So it gets sprayed over the cooling elements, which are kind of this porous media. And then the winds which come down the canyon, and I could go into why winds come up and down canyon and why they're very dependable, but I don't have time for all that. But the winds come down the canyon, um, hit these and force that cool air, along with the fact that the air has been cooled and is falling anyway, down to what looks like a fireplace, which I'm sure you sat in front of, and you got cooled by what looked like a fireplace in the middle of the summer. And uh, so, you know, just a wonderful project. We got an AIA Committee of the Environment Top 10 Greed Award. Um, I don't deserve all the credit. There were lots of good people on the team. There are uh, some of the prominent ones are listed there. But um, this is what those towers look like. And you can kind of see a little bit of a glisten from the water on the, on the towers. I'd love to be able to show you what's inside the towers and how they work and all that, but um, don't have time here. And then uh, for the winter, because it does get cold enough in the winter to need some heating, uh, we built a thermal storage wall we'll called a Trom wall. You may or may not have heard of it, but basically it's just a, a masonry, about an eight inch masonry wall behind glass. And uh, the sun, this is a south orientation. So in the winter, the sun's low in the sky, hits the glass, goes through, goes into the wall and um, That'll heat the building into the evening if they have programs in the evening, which they often do. And then you've got some clear stories above, which allow some direct gain for quick, quick warm up. So they need very little heat in the building because it's mostly heated by this trom wall, which is a totally passive device. And uh, then you know some PV panels to make up the less. This building used so little energy that the utility, <laughs> the utility that serves uh, Zion National Park um, uh, changed the utility rate on, on us and jacked up the utility rate because they couldn't make any money on the building. So they, you know, they at least had to make up their costs for keeping us on online. Um, batteries, batteries aren't quite cheap enough to just go totally off the grid yet, but that would be the next step. That's a great story, Ron. I am, um, you know, I've even known people that I, 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 I'm just kind of surprised that they just jacked the rates. Aren't I've seen some agreements where the utility companies actually have to buy energy back. So if you can create, you can actually start becoming an energy producer instead of an energy consumer. Well, remember we were pioneers. So this was before, you know, so, and this is where people in politics uh, do play, do play, you know, influencing the PUC and the FERC and all those um, alphabet soup of, folks involved in utilities and utility pricing. Um, that was before all of that. So their answer was, huh, 
suddenly these guys aren't paying us any money. We got to get some money. So, <laughs> so and then nothing stopped them from upping the, um, the utility uh, rate. <laughs> they were still getting less back, but they were getting something back. That's great. Thank you. Those are some great pictures. Um, we have Barbara would like to ask you a question. So I'm going to go ahead and ask her to unmute herself. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate it. Um, here in Boston, um, especially in Alston, Brighton, we're facing like a, a development proposal a week in terms of large apartment buildings and office buildings. And our 350 mass working group is trying to sort of come up with guidelines of what we're asking of developers. Do you have any advice around that? You know, I do. I would look at the California uh, code, California Energy Commission. Um, they actually have zero energy built into their code. Okay. And um, that's, that's really what you need. I mean, it's really hard if you try and start to try and say, well, you should put in a ground source heat pump and you should have so many square feet of windows facing in this direction. That's not gonna fly. What you really need is an energy code that is a very stringent energy code, but that it's quite possible to meet and actually it can be met economically has been proven in California. And uh, so look at, look at the energy codes in California that are you know, requiring in a phase in, you know, they didn't do it one year to the next, they're, they're phasing it in over a number of years, but all residential and commercial buildings, and they've dealt with all the definitional problems of supposing you have a building, you know, if you have a multi, if you have a 20 story building, it's not gonna have enough PV to power itself. So what do you do there? Mm -hmm. They dealt with all that, you know, and, and uh, I, I would use them as a model. Great, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ron. If anybody has any other questions, now would be a prime time to ask. Um, but I definitely think those were some good words of encouragement and some places to turn for, for the next resources. Um, Ron, I have a, a question. I know that uh, you, know, you recently retired. I'm wondering what you're gonna be spending your time on if you're gonna be still working in this field and, and where you're personally gonna direct your energies. So, well, I, I realized that I had a huge amount of material and a huge amount of, you know, um, knowledge that I was fortunate enough to gain by being able to work at NREL since 1978. So I, I kind of want to share that with the people who need it. So this was my first, my first venture. You, you guys are part of my first venture. It's not a money-making venture, but it's a, it's a venture. And, uh, and it was an ad venture too. Um, you know, trying to think about what would be the right uh, level to hit the talk at and all that, you know, I knew, I knew if I started to talk about, um, you know, the, the deep chemistries of photovoltaic cells that that probably wouldn't cut it or started to talk about the algorithms and the million lines of code for the energy model we use that that wouldn't be the right thing to talk about. So I hope I, I hit this at kind of the right level to be helpful to people. I certainly thought the, uh, the combination of graphs and, and the pictures here of Zion, the pictures uh, from when you were in the Peace Corps um, really presented a nice picture and, and helped bring home how we can have uh, you know, there, there's solid science, there's things we can do. It's a scary prospect, as we all know, um, but you didn't leave us feeling hopeless here at the end either, which I appreciate. Um, well, last last talk, we got left with the, what did, what did Sig call it? He called it the political um, roadblock or something like that. The iron triangles and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I definitely, I mean, it's not just because, uh, because um, Sig had presented it like that. I'm, th I'm sure he wasn't implying that we should give up hope either. Um, I think he was implying that, uh, you know, it's important to get in politics since I'm still associated with the lab. I still tend to be a little bit careful about um, talking about that, but I think Sig was telling us, hey, if you want to change things, that's the level you got to get in at. And, uh, you know, I understand things at a technical level, and I know that there are some technical solutions that um, are also uh, should should leave us with a lot of hope. 
we can certainly use all the hope we can find these days. I believe we have time for one last question and somebody has raised their hand. So um, Diana, I will ask you to unmute yourself and please uh, help us find our way to the end of the night. You're trying to get ordinary people interested. And I asked if when you were uh, redoing houses, we have a series. Can you hear me now? Is it any yes. better? Okay. Um, we have a series here in Boston called This Old House, which has gone on for a number of years. And they follow redoing a house week by week. And lots of people watch it. And... Um, even people who really know nothing about houses or rehabbing and it's on P, you know, PBS. And I was wondering when you did any of those nice house rehabilitations for energy, whether you had televised them or done them for the general public. Um, we hadn't, although it's interesting you mentioned this old house because um, the person that used to lead our Building America project, he's retired now, um, Ren Anderson, uh, was actually on uh, this old house. So he got to be on it talking about all the energy efficiency stuff for houses. And then this old house um, took him up on it. And they always, you know, they always try to do the most energy efficient thing they can do. They try to do things right. So they always, re, you know, they always add insulation during their rehabs. They always um, try and get really efficient heating and cooling systems in there. Now they are at the, you know, at the mercy of some very wealthy homeowners because usually they're showing very expensive uh, homes. So they have to, you know, a lot of times they have to stick to the, you know, a, a Victorian um, theme or whatever the theme for the house is. But within that, Within that, they do uh, they do a pretty good job, and we did uh, we did work with them, and and uh, one of our folks was on on TV. More photo, they put someone more photogenic than me on on the program. <laughs> Is that all over the country? Um, this this old house, or just in the Boston area? Do you know? Is that shown all over the country? Oh, that show is all over the country. Yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. WGBH show that's syndicated across PBS stations all over the place. Yeah. So, well, thank you. That's inspiring. Maybe there's some people listening who can think about how to combine this old house with Habitat for Humanity with like some, some more park rescues and we can do some great open space uh, appreciation with some awesome design. There's, there's a lot to think about here tonight. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I wish everybody a wonderful evening. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks. Ron. Wonderful program. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for having me and uh, bearing with me for my uh, maiden voyage into uh, you know Zoom talks. <laughs>